Hi, this is lesson 12.1, functions of two variables. Welcome to multivariable. And we're going to start looking at functions that are defined in two variables or of two variables. So if we look at <coughs> example here, if we want to know the monthly payment on a home loan, which we call a mortgage, it can be based on different criteria. Terms of the loan, amount of the loan, and interest rates. Those will all be ingredients to find a formula for the mortgage. So if I say Jong needs a $200,000 loan for 20 years at a prevailing interest rate, which can change daily, we want to write a function that represents this. My first error right out of the blocks. I want to know the monthly payment and represent the monthly payment that way. So we've written it like this. M is equal to F of R. That's a function of one variable, and this is what you are used to. So it does have two variables, but we say it's a function of one variable, as we have there. And the M is the dependent variable, and R is the independent variable. And let's move on to the next example with Jolene. With Jolene, now she needs a $200,000 mortgage, but is playing around with different terms for the loan. So she might be doing 30 years or 20 years. Uh, <clears throat> it's better to do something that you're comfortable with and maybe pay it off early rather than get into trouble by doing a really short-term loan that will stress you out. But write a function that represents this, and that's for the monthly payment again. So now we're going to go the monthly payment is equal to some function, and then we're going to have two variables that this is uh, working with. One is going to be the interest rate, and then the other one is going to be the term of the mortgage. And so when we represent this, this one, M, again, is the dependent variable because it depends upon... The independent variables R and T. Now you can get into a more specific formula for these uh, for these equations too, but right now we're just generalizing. If we do the next example, Pat doesn't know any constraints, any of the constraints, but wants to educate herself on a mortgage. Write a function that represents this. Well, we're now we're going to go. This is going to be rate, term, and principal. And so now you have a function of three variables. We're not going to do that. So total, four variables, but we're talking of three variables. And then this is the dependent variable that we're relying on, or that's relying on this other stuff. A graphical example in two variables would be potentially a weather map. And so isotherms, isotherms are these lines. And with these lines, we're going to separate out our temperatures. Now, that little red line that I just made is on the edge of light blue and dark blue. So that's going to be these two right here. But if you are right on that line that I just drew, you're going to be at 20 degrees because that's right in between dark blue and lighter blue. Or I should say the darker of the two blues. The question is, is what happens when I'm in between the two blues here at Minneapolis? And when we look at Minneapolis, it is in the blue area. Now, can we definitively say that it's 20 degrees? No, we cannot. But it's going to be, we can say that the temperature for Minneapolis is going to be between 10 and 20 degrees. So Minneapolis will range from 10 degrees up to 20 degrees, but not inclusive of 20 degrees because that would be right on the line between the blue, royal blue, and kind of that lighter blue. Tampa's down here on the coast someplace, and that one's smack dab in that yellow range, so that's going to be between 70 and 80. And if you are right on this line right here, then you know which is your exact temperature because you are going to be 70 degrees right along that line. Is the 70 degree line going to ever cross the 60 degree line? I don't think so. They cannot cross. So you got to be aware of that with these isotherms. And the isotherms are these lines. And you can't be 60 degrees at the same exact time that you're 70 degrees. And when you get a chance, go to the book. And I want you to check out the example on the body mass index. 
In this class, you're going to have to read some of those examples that are in the book and try to follow along to see how you sort it out for yourself. I think that's a really important skill for this class is that you got to really take care of your own learning. We did a little bit of that last year, but you're going to have to kind of polish things yourself and get in deeper by yourself with checking out different examples and trying different problems on your own. So here is the body mass index problem that's out of the book. I put it in here for you. And notice that the BMI is based upon a function of two variables. So this is where we get into multivariable, and that's what we're doing. So try to read that and follow along with that and see what that one is doing, but then also go to the book. I'm not going to always put these in your notes. Go to the book and read those and try to sort them out. Okay, algebraic examples when we're dealing with formulas. Now, I neglected to mention this on the weather map example, but we do have a function of two variables. So when I talked about Minneapolis and the temperature with Minneapolis in Minnesota there, the temperature is based upon your coordinates. Where are you? And so that would be your latitude and your longitude. So that would be temperature is a function of your latitude and your longitude. So whatever your coordinates are. And so that would be a function of two variables as well. So we can't find a variable, I'm sorry, a, a, an equation formula for this. But there's other things that we always try to find formulas for. And if you get a formula, sometimes that can make you very famous. And so there's mathematicians, economists, nutritionists, scientists, da, 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 that have found formulas that will work in their situation. And you may, and sometimes the formula works and sometimes it doesn't. And sometimes data doesn't allow you to get it into a formula, but sometimes it does. So here's an example where we can find a formula for a cone. We want to represent the volume in R and H, and we want to do the surface area in R and H as well. And so here's a picture of our cone, and you know that the volume is one-third of what you would have for its corresponding cylinder. Cylinder is pi r squared H, because remember that if we have a cylinder like this. So loaf of bread principle, find the area of the base. Well, we know the area of the base is pi r squared. And then you're just going to multiply by how many slices you have here. And from your geometry days, you know that the cone with re is compared to its respective cylinder is just going to be one third as much. Same thing with the pyramid and its respective prism. So here's a function of the volume in terms of r and h. Surface area is a little bit trickier because you do have this, well, this circle is easy. So this is r, so this is just going to be your pi r squared. So that would be one piece, and then you have the cone. And if you take the cone, and if you have the lateral surface area, it's going to look more like this. Where this right here is what we call our slant height. And this right here is going to be the diameter of this same circle here. That's what you're going around with. So that's going to be the diameter of that thing right there. So slant height is here, and if you notice that L squared is equal to H squared plus R squared. So L is equal to the square root of H squared plus R squared. I said diameter here. Woo! I got to get my school shoes on. That's circumference. And that's the circumference of this circle here. Okay, so obviously it's not the circumference of this one here. It's just going to be part of the circle that we do have. So this does turn out to be the surface area of the cone. I'm going to let you figure out where you get the LR from. But then also I need this in two variables, not three. So this is uh, pi r squared plus pi. What did we say L was? Well, that's the square root of h squared plus r squared. And then we're going to go times r. So that is your formula for the surface area of a right circular cone. The next, we could try typing uh, the points in here and then figuring out which is the x-axis, y-axis, and z-axis. I believe that GeoGebra is going to be different than what our book is offering us, and I don't know if we can rotate the axes around to get the 
x-axis out in front and then the y-axis out on the side. This one reverses those two, but play around with this. My <clears throat> This program isn't letting me do this, so I might have to make a separate video on how to play with this, but I think you can figure it out, uh, and we can maybe work on it in class too. So try this and play around with it. So if you look at here, this is the x-axis in our book. This is the y-axis in, in our book. If you look at GeoGebra, I believe that these are reversed. So play around with that, see if you can get it orientated like this, where this is the positive x and this is the positive y, but I don't know if you can. Here are the instructions for the TI calculator, and you can do the 3D graphing here. And so you can try that as well. Now, when we graph these things, you should find out that z equal to 4, this is a plane. So this is the xy plane when z is equal to 0. If z was equal to 4, it is a different plane, but we don't call it the xy plane. And then here, if I have my y equal to 0, then that would be the xz plane. And then the last one is z equal to, I'm sorry, y, x equal to 0 would be this one right here, which would be the yz plane. So I have these in different orders, but that one's there. So if we look at this example, which of these points lies closest to the xz plane? And so if you think about that, y equal to 0 gives me the xz plane, so we're probably looking at the y coordinates. And then which point lies on the y axis? So we draw out our axis system as such. And then this is my y and this is my x. And when we plot these different points, well, it's, it's a little bit tricky to plot all these on this axis, but you can do it. But, and then do three-dimensional with it. But then which one lies closest to the xz plane? Now, if you notice, here is the y-coordinate of negative 1. Here's one of three, here's two, and here's negative four. Which one of those would be closest to the XZ, XZ plane, which is this one right here, right? Since the XZ plane is the same thing as Y equal to zero, it's that plane right there, which one would be closest? Well, whichever point has the smallest Y coordinate. And so point A is the closest because it has the smallest y-coordinate. And then which one lies on the y-axis? Well, here's the y-axis. What has to be true? Well, you can have a y-value which for, for wherever you are on this y-axis. However, the z-value and the x-value would be 0. And so that would be point D. D is on the y-axis because x and z are 0. You just have to start getting your head around these, and the exercises will help you with that. The distance between two points in two space, we have this formula right here, which is based on Pythagorean theorem. When we're in three space, we have to find the length of this diagonal right here, which just turns out to be a double Pythagorean theorem because I need this side and I need this side right here. And so with this height, we know that it's z minus c. 
this one right here is going to be the Pythagorean theorem on this value and this value going here. So when we put it all together, they write it all out here, but now it's just going to be all three of them together, and this would be your distance formula for the distance between two points in three space. Go ahead and try these last three and see what you come up with. And then check with me, but do pause. Check with me and then we'll uh, go from there. So for the first one, I get square root of 11. Double check me on that. The second one, I just get the distance between these points and the origin just means x minus zero, y minus zero, z minus zero, and you put it into the formula. The last one, the equation for the sphere of radius one, that's all points that are going to be distance one from the origin. So it's going to be instead of this distance, we know that the distance is one. So we write the exact same thing except for we put a one here. Square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared is equal to one. Notice we can square both sides and we get this right here. So this is the equation of a sphere. Now, if I switch the center to 1, 3, 2, that's just going to shift things a little bit. So we get x minus 1 quantity squared plus y minus 3 quantity squared plus, remember your translations, z minus 2. I should have put a negative number in there so you see that you get a plus, And square root is equal to 1. Notice you can square both sides on that one as well, and we get this as our final. All right? So this is the introduction. I want you to play around. Check out some of the examples that they have in the book that I did not do, and then get on with the homework that we do have for you. The gifts, I call them gifts. Sometimes I call them homework by accident, fall back into bad habits, but I like them as gifts. If you do your gifts, that's where you're going to learn. Then you also have bonus gifts. If you're interested in physics, you can do these, a little bit of money, and then there's other ones that you can try as well. All right, thank you for listening, and I hope that you have a great day. Take care.